welcome to Spring Law's 2019 Spring Forward Legal Updates webinar series. This series is designed to provide a comprehensive legal overview of key issues related to employment law and human rights in Ontario. Spring Law is a virtual employment law firm advising on workplace legal issues for employers, employees, freelancers, and executives from a wide range of industries. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar and find it useful and informative. To reach our team, please visit Spring Law at www.springlaw.ca. And now, to our presenters. Good morning and welcome to the Spring Forward Legal Updates webinar series. Today is the first of our 2019 webinars and our title today is So Many ESA Changes, What's the Law Today? My name is Lisa Stamm and presenting with me today are my colleagues Oren Barbalot and Hilary Page. If you are one of our clients, you already know we are employment and contracts lawyers at Spring Law, a virtual law firm based in Ontario. If you are new to our law firm community, welcome. Our webinar series is a rapid fire snapshot of where the law is right now in your workplace. Each session is half an hour on the third Wednesday of the month to get you in and out and back to your busy day. The webinars will be available on demand afterwards through our website for your team or for any colleagues you may think would benefit from the program. During the webinar, please feel free to ask questions through the chat function. If we cannot get to your questions during this half hour, we'll be sure to reach out to you directly afterwards. Slides will be provided after the presentation, or you can download them uh, right here under the handouts tab in the software. Finally, for more information about our firm, please visit our website at springlaw.ca. We have a variety of resources there, including our award-winning weekly blog posts, our free Bill 47 ebook, a link to subscribe to our monthly uh, subscription, sorry, to our monthly newsletter, and information about our innovative subscription program for employers. I will now pass it over to Hillary and Oren to walk through the roller coaster of recent Employment Standard Act changes in Ontario. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. My name is Oren Barbalat. I'm an associate at Spring Law. I'll just provide you with a quick overview of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so we're going to do a little intro on Bill 47. Uh, we're going to talk about leaves, misclassification of employees as independent contractors, scheduling, minimum wage, equal pay for equal work, the related employer provisions, public holiday pay, vacation, and then we're gonna kind of wrap it up with some takeaways and we'll be taking some questions. So first, Bill 47, as you all know from reading all of our wonderful blog posts, uh, Bill 47 uh, was enacted on November 21st, 2018, and it repealed many of the ESA amendments previously introduced by Bill 148. So there's a lot of changes some things stay the same. We're going to walk you through uh, all of that so you're up to date on the current state of the law. So we'll start off um, with leaves. Yes, so I think um, probably the, the leave that generated the most fuss when it was introduced by Bill 148 uh, was the personal emergency leave. So under Bill 148, that gave employees a total of 10 days of personal emergency leave per year, two of which were paid. So Bill 47 um, got rid of personal emergency leave and replaced it with three types of leave. So there are three, three types of new leave. There's sick leave, which is three unpaid days a year, family responsibility leave, three unpaid days a year, and bereavement leave, two unpaid days a year. So uh, whereas an employer, an employee could have used their 10 days of personal emergency leave for for those same reasons, but you know there was no determination of how many days had to be allocated for each leave. Now they are um, portioned out like that. Another big change here was that uh, Bill 148 prohibited employers from asking for a doctor's note. Um, to, to verify the reason for the leave during those first 10 days of personal emergency leave, that has been repealed by Bill 47. So an employer, 
is now permitted to require a, a doctor's note or a note from a qualified health practitioner um, if someone happens to take one of these leaves. Thanks, Hillary. Um, so I'll just briefly re review domestic or sexual violence leaves. Uh, these were introduced by Bill 148, but they're unchanged by, by Bill 47, so they're still the law. So employees are entitled up to 10 days for a domestic or sexual violence leave, up to a potential maximum of 15 weeks. So the first five days are paid while the remaining are unpaid. The 10 days are, um, you know, they're, they're intended to allow the employee to do things like attend medical appointments, whereas the 15 weeks are generally for more um, serious situations, such as if an employee has to make moving arrangements, for example. Um, so the 15 weeks as well do not have to be taken consecutively. Some of the requirements to take a domestic or sexual violence leave are uh, first of all, the employee has to be employed for 13 consecutive weeks, and then their child or the employee, of the, sorry, the employee or their child must experience domestic or sexual violence or the threat of domestic or sexual violence. Now, with these leaves, the employer, the employer is allowed to request evidence that is reasonable in the circumstances. So. The Ministry of Labor hasn't exactly said what that might mean, um, but similar to the sick leaves and family responsibility leaves and bereavement leaves that Hillary just discussed, there's no evidence, there's no prohibition on requesting a medical certificate to substantiate the employee's entitlement to the leave. So really, it's up to the employer here to decide if if they want to request that. Um, and you know you're, you're gonna you're gonna want to ask yourself whether or not it's a trustworthy employee, whether or not you think it's necessary. But certainly, um, you'd be within your rights to to request any evidence that uh, this type of leave is required. Now I'll I'll hand it over to Hillary to to discuss pregnancy leaves. Yeah. So pregnancy and parental leave. Um, these were two leaves that were both amended by Bill 148 and Bill Bill 47. Does, does not change them. So the Bill 148 version of these leaves in the ESA is as is. Um, I won't read out all of the, all everything on this slide about pregnancy leave. You can read that for yourself. But basically, these amendments were to um, bring the leave provisions in the Employment Standards Act in line with uh, the federal government's changes to the employment insurance program that would permit the um, 18 months of leave. So it just extends the leaves. So this, this slide speaks to the pregnancy leave. And then our next slide um, is uh, for parental, parental leave. Um, so in combination, the pregnancy leave and the, the parental leave, um, that's generally sort of what we think of as, as the entire leave for when someone has a baby or, or when they adopt. And over to you, Oren, for uh, the final word on leaves. Thanks, Hillary. So here we just have a list of the, the leaves that remain unchanged. So you have uh, the family medical leave, organ donor leave, family caregiver, critical illness, child death leave, um, crime-related child disappearance leave, emergency leave, declared emergencies, and reservist leave. So these, these are all fairly straightforward, and, and they're unchanged from Bill 47. So um they're they're still the law and yeah. uh, i'll hand it back over to hillary to discuss uh, misclassification of employees yeah so just as, as just a final note on leaves the big <laughs> leave change by bill 47 really was that personal emergency leave change um so that's what what employers are going to be wanting to look out for because whereas employees were entitled to the 10 days two paid eight unpaid now now it's that combination of three leaves totaling eight unpaid days. Okay, so uh, moving on to another Bill 47 change. So Bill 148 amended the ESA to include a provision that, um, that put the burden on the employer to prove that any worker who claimed that they were an employee when they were classified as an independent contractor 
uh, the burden would have been on the employer to prove that they were actually an independent contractor. So this is a distinction that is important um, because it can have a bunch of ramifications, um, tax ramifications and uh, real financial impact for employers. You don't have to pay an, an independent contractor things like public holiday pay over time. Uh, you know, you don't have to take deductions from their um, their their paychecks because they're invoicing you and they're running their own business. Um, but employers sometimes do hire independent contractors where the person should be more properly classified as an employee. So people can run into trouble there. Um, and Bill 148 really amended the ESA to make it uh, to make it harder for employers to to um, assert that someone was an independent contractor as opposed to an employee. An employee. Um, Bill 47 has changed that. So now uh, that that putting the onus on the employer part is taken away. <laughs> So it's a little bit complicated. If you do have specific questions about that, we do have some blog posts on it, or um, you know, we're happy to take your questions. But but basically, Bill Forty Seven has uh, changed that that part of the ESA to make it a little more employer friendly. Larry, so I'll, I'll talk about scheduling now. Bill Forty Seven. It, it made a few tweaks to some of these scheduling provisions introduced by Bill 148. So what stays the same is the three hour rule for shortened shifts. And that rule is essentially that if an employee regularly, regularly works more than three hours uh, per shift and attends, but they work less than three hours, even though they're available to work longer, the employee is required or the employer is required to pay the employee or three hours of work. So that stays the same. That's still the law. What was repealed by Bill 47, um, as you'll see on the next slide, is that um, is the employee's ability to request scheduling or work location changes, as well as the employee's right to refuse work or on-call requests made with less than 96 hours of notice. Those are fairly straightforward. And Hillary, on to you for minimum wage. Yeah, so minimum wage, this one was definitely in the news, so I expect that you're all aware of this. But um, Bill 47 froze the minimum wage increases that were in Bill Bill 148. So uh, and this so the fourteen dollars an hour is frozen currently um, until October first, twenty twenty. Um, and uh, this is just for the general minimum wage. So there are also, uh, there's a whole minimum wage schedule in the Employment Standards Act, which speaks to a couple of different types of minimum wage. For example, there's a student minimum wage, there's the minimum wage for servers and people who get tips. Um, so if, if your workplace does have one of those um, types of workers, you'll want to check that out. But um, no more $15 minimum wage for the moment. And uh, equal pay for equal work was another one that that did change. Um, so this was the amendment in Bill 148 that prohibited employers from paying a different rate of pay based on the employment status of a worker. So by employment status, um, what was meant was uh, like part time, permanent, temporary. So that type of thing. So you might have some part-time workers who got paid at a lower rate than full-time workers. Under the Bill 148 version of the ESA, that would have been a violation. Um, but that has been repealed by Bill 47. So uh, you are now allowed to pay workers who um, have different employment statuses. So part-time versus full-time. Seasonal is somewhere where we see this a lot. You know, some businesses have full-time employees and then they add workers for the summer. Um, under, under, the, under the current version of the ESA, those employees can be paid a different rate of pay. So uh, as we say on the slide here, there's still a prohibition from determining rate of pay based on sex, um, as well as any other prescribed ground in the Human Rights Code. So uh, basically, 
you can, you know, you can pay people differently based on their seniority or um, their skill if they're doing different jobs, for example. But and, you know, and now if they have a different employment status, but uh, but that's it. Okay, the related employer provisions. These were not changed by Bill 47, but we're going to quickly review them because they they are fairly important to employers and something employers should keep in mind. Um, what Bill 148 did was, so the ESA contained a provision that in order for employers to be related for each other's ESA entitlements, which could include things like severance, there had to be an intention or effect of the businesses to directly or indirectly defeat the uh, purpose of the ESA. Bill 148 removed that requirement. Um, so this now makes it easier for separate businesses to be liable um, for an employer's ESA entitlements, which again, um, really matters when it comes to things like severance for uh, for large corporations. And, um, you know, if you have a relationship with another business, it makes it easier to be liable for, for any ESA entitlements they might have. Public holiday pay. So this one uh, has seen a lot of action in the last in the last year or so. Um, so Bill 148 changed the um, the way that public holiday pay was calculated to make it uh, generally more friendly to workers who who were part time workers. Um, prior to Bill 47, this was changed back to the pre Bill 148 formula, and um, Bill 47 has just verified that, that it's going to stay the way that it always was. So for employers who have been on a bit of a roller coaster with uh, what to do about public holiday pay, you know, as you were, <laughs> and this is how it's calculated, <laughs> but it has been, it has been a bit of a roller coaster and we also, we do have some blog posts on that if, if you have any questions, um, uh, questions about how to calculate public holiday pay. <clears throat> and uh, I think so. And so uh, after so vacation pay, this was probably the other big amendment um, under Bill 148 that we saw a lot of employers having to make changes with. Um, and uh, so Bill 47 doesn't change anything that Bill 148 did with respect to vacation pay. So the change here, the ESA pre Bill 148 used to require that employers just give a minimum of two weeks of vacation, period. It didn't matter how long the employee had worked for the employer, two weeks. Um, Bill 148 changed that to three weeks after five completed years. And uh, Bill 47 did not change that. So that stays. And that's something we saw. We had to amend a lot of contracts um, for that because contracts that gave an employee just two weeks of vacation, but maybe the employee had worked there for eight years, that contract would have then violated the ESA because it would have given a, a lesser benefit than the statute provided. And so that's what employers generally want to be looking out for. Um, with all of these changes, it has been it has been a roller coaster. It's been confusing. People have been having to update their contracts and their handbooks, um, you know, and then change them back and try to figure everything out. Um, and the, the reason that 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 we want to be in compliance and we want in compliance and know what the law is, is, is because you can't um, give employees less than they're entitled to under this, under this statute, under the ESA. And over to you, Orrin, for some takeaways. Thanks, Hillary. That, that was actually a good lead in. Um, as you may have picked up on, Bill, Bill 47 is generally pretty employer friendly. Um, which is in obviously in contrast to Bill 148, which introduced a lot of provisions that were employee friendly. So overall, the what's really important to keep in mind is that your contracts and employee handbooks should reflect the current state of the law. As Hillary just pointed out, it, it's very important to make sure that you're not providing any benefit that's less than the ESA, right? So you're obviously free to provide more, 
But once your contracts or handbooks are providing less, um, it could get murky and there could be some problems down the road. So another thing is, you know, we're, we're always here to chat about the current state of the law and you should be prepared to answer some of these questions uh, from frontline employees. You know, they might want to know what their entitlements to vacation are. Leaves will probably come up a lot. Um, minimum wage, that's obviously received a lot of press as Hillary's mentioned. Um, I think so, also yeah. the, sorry to interrupt, Orin, I think the, um, the scheduling provisions, so that three hour rule, if anyone's heard that phrase, um, that was scheduled to come into force under under the Bill 148 version of the act um, this January, I, I believe. So that didn't come into a force because of Bill 47, but I think that employees maybe were kind of waiting for that one because they would have gotten three hours of pay in situations like where they had their shift canceled less than 96 hours before the beginning of a shift, um, stuff like that. So yeah, I feel like there are, there are definitely some workplaces where employees were, were well aware of the law and they may not be aware that it's changed. Yeah. Um, uh, Hillary and Oren, there was a question that came in from one of the attendees. So I just want to read that out and um, throw it over to you to answer. Um, I think it was partly uh, related to the first bullet that you uh, went through, Oren. Does this mean that we have to make new contracts for all of our employees? What about our employee handbooks? Hillary, do you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> sure, sure. So you want to have a look at your handbook and um, your contracts and make sure that they are complying with the ESA as it is right now. So um, you may want to get a lawyer to have a look at it for you. <laughs> but uh, if you know if you amended your contracts um, after Bill 148, Bill 47 hasn't changed anything that's going to uh, that's going to make uh, a lesser benefit. So your contracts may be um, overly generous if you're looking to simply provide minimum standards, um, but that doesn't make them invalid. They would be invalid if they're doing things like providing uh, less than um, than an employee would be entitled to under the ESA. So uh, a lot of this stuff is not really generally covered in an employment contract. Um, for example, we don't normally see every leave listed out in an employment contract, and that's fine. The terms of the ESA are kind of incorporated into the legal landscape of, um, of the employment relationship anyway. Um, the main thing I think you'd want to look out for is the vacation piece. That's sort of where we saw contracts um, with invalid provisions, primarily, where employers were just giving two weeks of vacation um, and, and not accounting for the change to three weeks after five years of service. <clears throat> um, and uh, similarly with handbooks, sometimes handbooks do set out leaves and and that type of thing. Um, you're just going to want to make sure that there's nothing in there that's providing a lesser benefit than the 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 ESA, the ESA does currently. You know, the the other piece that is related to all of this, if I can hop in, is mm -hmm. it's not so much what is in the contract or handbook, but how it's rolled out. And um, what we did see in 2018 uh, was a lot of workplaces turning their mind to the issue of of the enforceability of their contracts uh, and their handbooks um, and looking to uh, make revisions to comply with the ESA and then thinking, oh wait, well, while we're at it, why don't we um, put in a, a, a better termination provision or you know, doing other tweaks that, that may be introducing a really adverse term mm -hmm. and then you get some, some legal, um, legal issues there if you're looking to roll out a contract that even though some of the ESA provisions are now bumping up some of the previous entitlements, if you start introducing other adverse or, or uh, lesser rights, especially around a termination provision, then you're looking you're looking for trouble. And and um, there's definitely a way to do it. It's it's a matter of rolling out what's called consideration to make sure that you are giving the employee something in exchange for them signing off on a contract that might be introducing a an adverse term or a, a less 
beneficial term than before. Um, but there is a bit of a legal nuance to that in order to make sure it's, it's enforceable. So it's 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 fine to roll out a revised contract that complies with the ESA. But if you're looking to make other changes, um, take a look at whether or not it's adverse, and then you may want to um, check in with a lawyer on that to make sure you can still rely on the contract in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and generally you don't want to just sort of be switching up your employee's contract all the time. Um, you know, there, there's, as Lisa said, definitely a way to do that. Carefully. Yeah, rolling out an amendment or some sort of policy might, you know, across the board on vacations, for example, might mm -hmm. be a much better way to do it than to try and roll out fresh contracts to address vacations. Yeah. And another place I think that uh, we saw a lot of employers changing contracts and sort of really giving a lot of thought to their policies was on sort of like the sick day, personal day type of stuff. And in, in many employers, um, yeah, we're in a bit of a tricky position because the ESA itself has has taken away that two paid days of leave um, benefit, which a lot of employers had incorporated into their policies and their contracts. Yeah. Yeah. Or for anyone who is in a unionized workplace and was bargaining into the fall, we have mm -hmm. at least one client struggling with that, knowing that it's likely mm -hmm. that the 47 or some, uh, you know, more employer-friendly provisions were coming down the pipe. The union also knew that and 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 can push quite hard for these provisions to get them in place while it was law. So, yeah. Uh, as we were heading later into the fall and it became more clear that these provisions would be rolled out, it, um, it, it became a tricky negotiating issue for many, many sides. Yeah, and I think in particularly in the unionized environment, the um, the equal pay for equal work provision uh, mm. has really created some waves because that's an environment where we do see sort of wage schedules set often by employ uh, by by status so you know part-time being paid different differently than full-time and um, under the bill 148 version of the ESA that wasn't allowed so yeah a lot of complex stuff going on right now I also just wanted to mention that um, there is bill 46 sorry bill 66 is currently uh, in second reading and it um, you know, should it pass, will bring in more ESA changes. So <laughs> we'll keep you up to date about that. But uh, the wild ride is not over. And that's the Restoring <laughs> Ontario's Competitiveness Act, um, if anyone's heard about that, Bill 66. Not that ESA amendments are politically charged whatsoever. <laughs> but that's totally partly the legal name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, well, two minutes to go. Do you want to take us out, Lisa? Sure. You guys are all done here. Um, thank you, Hillary and Oren, for walking us through the program today. Uh, that does conclude our Spring Law Legal Updates. Uh, we hope you join us for our next webinar, which will be on March 20. The topic that day will be how to contain your workplace legal fees with your tech and data systems. Um, if you have any other questions, um, uh, feel free to reach out to any of our lawyers. We, we have the, um, the contact information there. Um, you can sign up directly for the next webinar also on the website. That'll just take you right into the registration. Um, on our website, we have all kinds of resources. Our newsletter, you're welcome to sign up to. Our award-winning blog is there. Um, and please feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and now Instagram. We started Instagram in 2019. Um, uh, late to the show, I know, but we're on Instagram now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, we hope that you can join us again on March 20 for our next session. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.